Let's turn to exploring the Shema discussions on the issues of Trinity and pick up the study where we left off two weeks ago. Take the next 30 minutes to look at this. Romans chapter 8, verses 9 through 11, is a concentrated passage where Paul is talking about the Spirit of God. In this particular part of our study, we're focusing on the overlap of information that the Bible provides for us in describing God's Spirit. And what we're going to end up with, if we read the Bible from a cover to cover and not cherry pick, if we allow the whole Bible to speak for itself, we'll notice that God's Spirit is described using language that attributes the Spirit to God Himself, meaning God the Father. And yet, there are times and places in the Bible where the Spirit, and we're going to find out this tonight right here, where the Spirit is equated and related to the Son of God. And then there are other times, of course, in the Apostolic Scriptures where the term Holy Spirit is interpreted to mean a third person of the Godhead, the third person of the Trinity, or a separate um, aspect of God, not a separate being, not a separate entity. Um, I mean, it's kind of hard to articulate the Trinity with, without describing uh, three gods or, or one God who wears three masks, right? We're avoiding modalism on one hand. That's a ditch of error and heresy that we want to avoid. And we're avoiding tritheism on the other hand, right? That's a ditch and error that we want to avoid as well. I'll put a little graphic on the screen of ditches that we want to avoid, like a kind of a bowling ball motif uh, picture that you're, you know, when you're bowling, you want to roll your bowl right down the middle and avoid what? The gutters on the left and the right. Well, modalism on one side is one gutter and tritheism on the other side is another gutter. You don't want your ball to fall into either one of those two ditches of error as you're bowling your rolling bowling your ball down the center lane. You want to hit a strike. And when we're talking about um, Trinity and uh, the Godhead and understanding this triune nature that we serve, we don't want to avoid the error of modalism and the error of um, tritheism. All right, so here in Romans, let's just read the passage first, and then we'll go back and exegete it. Paul says, and this is ESV for us, quote, verse 9, You, however, and he's speaking to believers, by the way, that's the context. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. We're actually going to go back and read the full um, set leading up to this. We may just only spend all of our time on Romans uh, chapter 8, verse uh, this section right now. We may not even get to another uh, verse, which I'm fine with if we take the whole 30 minutes looking at this. He says to these believers, you, however, not in the flesh, but in the spirit, right? He's talking to believers. And of course, this fact that they're not in the flesh, but in the spirit is only true if, Paul says, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. So the first indicator or um, the first uh, description of God's spirit is that it's the spirit of God. Notice that. Notice very carefully. If the spirit of God is dwelling in you. So the Spirit of God is inside of a believer, right? Remember, this is a section on who or what Spirit is indwelling us as believers. Is it the Spirit of God? Is it the Spirit of Messiah? Or is it the Spirit of the Holy One or the Holy Spirit? Is it the Spirit of the Holy? I like to jokingly say. All right, which Spirit? Is it, or is it all three, right? Are we to imagine that there are three Spirits inside of us? That kind of, sounds kind of spooky, right? <laughs> or even a fourth one, because Ariel's Spirit still lives in there as well. He doesn't get displaced by God's Spirit. But no, that's really not the way. I mean, that's an obvious um, answer. It's really not the way we're, we're, we're to interpret it. But Paul says, the Spirit of God dwells in you if you are a believer, if you are in the Spirit and not in the flesh. And then with the same breath, in the same writing, without skipping a beat, he says, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. Well, this is a little strange. Paul, you just used the phrase Spirit of God. Why would you now introduce something known as the Spirit of Christ as if it is a separate spirit? I mean, it sounds odd. In fact, to further the confusion, in verse 10 he says, but if Christ is in you, wait a minute, didn't you say in verse 9 that it's God that dwells in us? Notice how Paul is interweaving the complex nature of God living in a believer. How does this take place? Via the Spirit. But notice that we have suddenly certain elements that Trinitarians are fond of highlighting. We have God and we have God's Spirit. We have Messiah 
and we have Messiah's spirit, and we have the believer. Thank you.